Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today we're gonna to talk about pretty much the last part that will fail on your BMW. Here's a pump I got, and I know a lot of you guys are gonna say, hey, why are you putting something made in China on your car? I pretty much agree with that statement, but there are times where there's a huge price discrepancy versus OEM parts, and if you put that part on your car, it wouldn't leave you stranded if it were to fail. This part here was about $130 for a brand new pump. Here's a look at the pump itself. Because my car has active steering, it has this electrical connector here that would be different from your standard pump. Uh, but if this were to let me down, the worst case scenario, I'm back at square one where I have heavy steering and I can get my car home. I'm spending $130 instead of $900, so the trade-off is worth it. But there are times where you should just never do this and install anything but OEM parts, and I'll give you an example. Here's an example of where I wouldn't take a chance. This is a VDO pump, an OEM water pump for my car, which I'll be installing in an upcoming video. I have new bolts and a new hose. Definitely wouldn't even go there to save a hundred and something dollars to go aftermarket. I would not do that. I would go OEM for this because this could leave you on the side of the road and you don't want to mess around. And the delta in terms of cost between this water pump and a Chinese one or a cheap one is not that great. But with the power steering pump, you're talking about a tenth the cost, so I have to go that route. So like I said, this is the power steering pump and there is the active front steering connector that integrates with the system. The reservoirs on an active front steering car are gonna look a little bit different. It's gonna be more flat versus the ribbed cap. So the reason why I say this is one of the last things that fail because mine ended up lasting about 200,000 miles before it started to cut out. My symptoms were when I was turning at low speed, it would be choppy, it would come and go. The assistance would be really herky-jerky, but only after the car was fully warmed up. You wouldn't feel it right away. And at highway speeds, it was heavier than it should have been. So that would be some of the earliest signs of failure. I wanted to get to it before it could start making noise and grenading itself and introducing a bunch of metal particles in the system and the whole thing would require a flush. Right now it's quiet and the fluid is still clean. So that's where I wanted to be. I'm getting at it proactively as the first signs of failure. It may have lasted quite a bit longer, but still it's not reassuring feeling when your steering is not spot on. Same thing goes with the water pump, buying that prematurely. Uh, what I noticed was sometimes when I turn my car on when it's cold, the fan will go to full blast for like 30 seconds to a minute and then settle down. And you'd hear the fan cycling quite often uh, at speed. The oil temperature was also getting a little bit warmer. So I just noticed that it, maybe this uh, pump is failing. Mine has over 70,000 miles on it or about at least 60 something thousand miles. So it's time to change it anyway. So if your car even feels a little bit off, it's always good to investigate if something seems a little bit different than what you're used to if you've been driving it for years. I know a very small percentage of cars have active front steering on the E90 chassis, but something that I'll demonstrate once we get the new pump in for testing purposes is it varies the ratio of the steering rack via a planetary gear and an electric motor. Now, depending on your speed, the ratio will change. So it'll be less than two turns lock to lock if the car is stationary. It will change its ratio depending on vehicle speed and also conditions. So for instance, if you're over 70 miles an hour, it becomes more direct. If you're going 80, 90, 100, it'll actually be less direct than a normal steering rack. It will cause the electric motor to spin the opposite direction to make it less direct so that you have more of a stable feeling on the highway. Normally with a steering rack, what would happen is you'd have to choose a trade-off between a good ratio for around town and not feeling too nervous on the highway. So what this gives you is a ratio that would be uh, unattainable because your car would change lanes with the slightest input at highway speed if you had to be super assisted and super quick at low speeds. So it just varies the ratio, kind of like an S-curve depending on vehicle speed. And if you go fast enough, it'll even make it less direct than a regular rack, which is nice. I think one of the reasons this option wasn't very popular back in the day is because the ratio would have felt a little bit too light and overly assisted at low speeds and it felt out of character for a BMW, I think, of the era. This is relatively light at slow speeds and it gets pretty heavy at highway speeds. I used to have an O1330i back in the day and it came with a very light steering feel. People complained about it and they actually had to make it a little bit heavier. So I feel people that would test drive a BMW with active steering may have found it too light at uh, regular speeds. I've come accustomed to it and it was kind of like a good way to bridge the gap between hydraulic power steering and electric power steering. So if you really wanted to know what the difference is uh, with one of these cars, it's gonna be how quick the ratio feels at slow speeds, especially like in a parking lot. But if you're on the highway and you do a really quick lane change or an evasive maneuver, 
you'll find that it helps counter steer for you to not upset the chassis balance as well, which is nice. So the rack is still hydraulic, so you still maintain feel, especially as the speeds increase. One of the last features that active front steering will give you is compensation if the road is uneven. If you're on an angled road like this, the car's kind of tilted, the weight will be shifted toward the right wheel. If you're to brake really hard, you may find that that has more weight on it, therefore it has more traction if it's wet, etc. And the car would pull to the right a little bit. You need to rely on the ABS to kind of settle the car. But in this case, uh, the active servo motor that drives the planetary gears and the steering rack would compensate so that you get a steady brake feel. Even though the car's weight is shifted to the right, if you brake hard, it will counter steer via the motor and make the car feel stable under heavy braking without the intervention of the DSC system. So, you know, it wasn't just a variable ratio that made this kind of unique. And I feel like it kind of feels a little more modern compared to new cars in terms of steering feel and ratios, etc. Now on a car like this G80 M3, they're able to vary the steering ratio and add a bunch of features just because the steering wheel is purely electric. So in a way nowadays, they can just program that into the equation. They can make the ratio variable with logic purely based on the steering assist because it's purely electric. But back in the day, they had to do it via the servo assist. At the end of the day, they've come a long way with their steering feel, and this is actually pretty decent in the new M cars. At the end of the day, I think the trade-offs with electric power steering are worth it, considering you get all these convenient features like self-parking, self-reversing, stuff like that. So besides all the logic and background information, this is also going to be a DIY on how to replace one of these on an E90. If you don't have active steering, you're just not going to have that connector, but the procedure will be pretty similar. So we'll walk through how to get that done now. So you got to remove your air snorkel, two T20s. And if you're looking to do this proactively before it can really give you trouble, like I said in the title of this video, it's going to be probably the last thing you have to worry about on your car, but I'd recommend you do it at around 200,000 miles, which is pretty good considering. If you flush your fluid and whatnot, you should get that far. So we're gonna have to remove the fan shroud. Disconnect the electrical connector. You have one T27 Torx up at the top. So I have a aftermarket oil pressure sensor that I disconnected my harness from. I went after another one of those screws down below holding your trans cooler to your shroud. I removed the inlet just to create working room, but it's not gonna be necessarily required if you guys just wanna reach around it. Before we lose any belt tension from releasing the belt, I'm gonna crack these 13 mil power steering bolts loose. Next up, we have the belt tensioner right there, T60. Now I can go after these bolts and just take this pulley right off while it's up here. If you didn't already catch it, I upgraded this to metal. So that'll conclude the work from up top. Now we'll get the car jacked up and go underneath. I'm gonna go underneath and get the splash shield removed. So as you can see, I have my E12 socket on that uh, power steering pump bracket bolt. There's one, there's one there, and then there's one on the side. So if you just reference the sway bar, uh, you can see what I'm doing from here, but I'm going from the front of the car in between the intercooler and the front pulleys. Just using a 10 mil ratcheting, once I crack those free, makes life a little easier. So there's just enough room to get a ratchet on there to release that last bolt for the power steering pump. So I was able to remove the electrical connector right here, just by reaching behind here and getting access to the connector if you have active steering. I had to unbolt the power steering reservoir. There's two 10 mil nuts on top of this to give me some slack down there. So doing so made it so that I could pull the pump forward enough to go after this 22 mil banjo bolt. I just used a short uh, socket on my 3 8 ratchet swivel. You may find that it's easier to go after that banjo bolt while the pump is still bolted to the engine if you're able to reach down along the side of the motor. But I found that it would be easier to create some slack and pull the pump forward, go after that 22 mil banjo bolt. And then now we're gonna go after the line that leads up to the reservoir. So if you look, the line that goes down to the pump leads up to here. It's gonna be a lot easier to cut off the clamp from up here than it would be from down there. And then just pull the pump forward with this line connected. And then we can swap over the line to the new pump. So for now, I'm gonna cut that clamp over there to be able to remove this line. 
There's a clamp removed. So now that line will just pull down with the pump as I pull it forward from the bottom. So I figured I'd give it a shot trying to leave my aftermarket intercooler in place getting that pulled out but it's pretty apparent now that the intercooler is going to have to come out to get enough room to get that out. If you really want to you could try to remove the bracket at this position and then squeeze it out but I don't think it's worth the headache. So we'll get the intercooler out of the way. All right, so in hindsight, that's definitely going to be my recommendation. Get the intercooler out of the way. This job shouldn't really be attempted without that removed. I probably wasted time I didn't need to. You got to move this line over to the new pump. And if you notice, there's a line on the hose here that lines up with this little notch here. And there's a similar one on the new pump. So we're going to follow that. We're going to make sure that this line here lines up here. Going after the bolts that hold the bracket to the power steering pump, the T40. So I just crack those loose down on the ground off camera. I'll clean these up and we'll move over to the new pump. All right, getting ready to put this back on the car now. I accidentally put that bracket on wrong. It goes like this, opposite of the connector, if you have active steering. FIA, that's how I tightened the banjo bolt for the 22 mil line feeding the power steering pump. This came in really handy, 22 mil offset box and wrench. So I got the line drawn back up here. Now that that's tightened up, I'm gonna reinstall the reservoir. Now I'll torque the power steering bolts to 21 newton meters. All right, time to put some power steering fluid in there. Got to use the CHF 11S. We'll give the car a start now. So right out the gate, the pump feels quiet, it's working perfectly. Remember I was talking about the car uh, running the fan really high as a sign of a water pump not doing too great? That would be an example right there. I don't know if there's enough heat in the system yet, but there's no steady stream of fluid coming out the coolant reservoir. So I think my water pump is intermittent. But that's a good example of what happens from what I've read when it's starting to go out. And you'll notice it does that here and there periodically while driving. So next up is water pump. And you guys may be wondering why didn't I just do it at the same time since I had the intercooler out. Ultimately, I'm just trying to make these videos authentic based on doing one job at a time. The steering feels good again. It's back to what you'd expect. I'm gonna do uh, one turn to show you how much the wheel turns just with active steering. That's 75% of a turn to the right. Here's all the way to the left. That's about like 1.5 turns. So it's almost like less than one to one in terms of ratio at low speed, which is pretty cool. So there you have it guys. That's hopefully one of the last things you'll ever have to do to your BMW. But after a couple hundred thousand miles, it will come due. So that shows you how to change it on an E90. If this is the first video you're catching in mind, please consider subscribing. If you liked the video, please give it a like so that it can rank higher. Thanks for watching.